So, hello. I would like to begin to start with the work you produce for the Kunstsang for sure. So, um, some words, maybe you can talk about the work here and tell us um, some words to the relation between the different realizations of this work. So it's based on, we already heard on the work staging, but here you changed so much. So the work that this work is coming from called staging, that was maybe some of you have seen it already, which was presented in Documenta. Um, it's a work that has many different parts. And the concept behind that work is that it never completed itself. There was a solo spread in different locations within the space that the work was installed. There was a quartet that it was only becoming a quartet a very particular hour of the day. Other than that, it was a solo duet, trio, quartet, and it kept on changing itself. The lighting there was two lighting sculptures installed in different locations. And all of these elements come together in the theater in the theater work, which is presented in theater spaces that is called staged. And staging, the idea behind is that it never completes itself unless it's performed in a theater space. For this work, because once I visited the space and discussed with uh, Susanna and Beatrice, we kind of decided together that we wanted to go for something a bit different, but not extremely different, not a new, new work, but something slightly based on that. Uh, I was interested in creating a work that it was more, it could stand alone, that it could complete itself. It doesn't need any other elements. And I was attracted to installing a, one single figure in this big space. At the same time, uh, the movement, let's say, the movement material and also the ideas of color are very much based on staging, on what I developed in staging. Also, the performers are pretty much the same, it's the same cast that was in that work as well. It's just that this work is complete by itself. Um, the first time you sh uh, it was at the Walker Art Center, we, you uh, showed uh, staging and when we go back what would you say what was the starting point when what was the driving elements in creation of this work when you started thinking this work because it had another work before staged yes. and how are these both two of works? This, I started creating both of the works together at the same time and the idea is that it was a, a, a diptych one created for a theater space and the one the other one created for exhibition spaces it has a lot to do with where, how I've been working, and I work in both venues, let's say, and how I deal with creating works in each space. And my initial interest, let's say, of creating this work was to abstract the human figure. It's very broad and basic <laughs> idea. But this is why right away I started thinking that I wanted to dress the performers with patterns and different colors. So when you see an arm, the arm is a different color from the leg. So when in different positions, you don't even know which, whose arm it is. For this work, it's only one person, but we try to still put a lot of different patterns in the shirt so it can still appear disjointed and it can get abstracted, let's say, even though you know very well it's a human being and it's a person. <laughs> So, is it a specific image or a form or, in a way, a narrative from which you start, even if you push it to abstraction, or is it really your interest in the body? But you ha you have to start with something. So, I mean, the idea is just what I said. Yeah. I so I was in the studio very much creating material. Material is always um, you can abstract it up to a point. Yeah, the human fi the human body can produce an X amount of movements and they're mostly recognizable and full of representations, all of them. So a way to abstract them is really by duration, by, in my mind, in my, the way that I work at least, is by holding something for a, long, a longer duration of time. And in the beginning that invites a reading for um, the obvious representation to come through, but through the stillness, maybe there's more wandering that can happen and it can let the, the initial um, idea, let's say, move away. And also, that with the stillness, something that I find interesting, the narrative gets stopped, gets cut. 
So if you were following this solo, let's say this performer today, and you were seeing them, you, we always try to make associations and try to make sense out of things, of whatever that it is that we're looking at. But because of the pauses, I think that it kind of stops our reading and it, it enters it in, a, in another place, maybe, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so you work first, you work on yourself in your studio, you work on the, the choreography. And what are the next steps? When do you. Um, collaborate when you speak with your dancers and uh, speak with the uh, costumers or as a sound designer so at what point um, do you open yourself for your partners sure well it is it's always a collabor a bigger a big team that is involved to make a show yeah because it's a show um, i do work alone but from very early on i book my collaborators because everybody's very busy so in a way there once I know that they're committed I kind of they're in my mind while I'm creating work and I work a lot with the same people so I know their limitations in a way their physical limitations and how what I can introduce to them in terms of movement it's not like I'm hiring ballerinas so we, you know maybe I would introduce another sort of movement vocabulary um, I also basically from the very start one and once I know I'm working on a particular show pulling the people together is a very important thing because you understand right away the colors of it in a way yeah like even if I know I'm gonna work with Marina and Stavros it's kind of like it frames what kind of sound we're gonna end up working with yeah is that clear and in the studio all together we come in stages okay maybe all together only in the premiere <laughs> but do you know from the beginning that which sound you would like to have and which with which designer you would like to work and so or from the beginning you kn well once i know what kind of work i want to make yeah. yes okay and then you ask of course the people and see if they're available and if they're interested okay and do you think because that uh, Do you think that your studies at Call Arts have shaped and supported your openness for this collaboration? Because from the beginning on, you always cooperated with designers, with artists, sound designers. Uh, so, do you think that your studies? Well, I'm sure I went to Call Arts when I was very young, and um, 1990. It was, yes. yes. And I was not even 17 when I went there. So, I think it, resh it shaped me even more than normally let's say because i really learned everything you know like it was like abc almost um, and being a color is such a small environment at least it was back in the early 90s of all artists together and exchanging ideas and working together that of course then later on moving to new york i stayed with some of the, those old friends and collaboration, collaborators that are still around in my life, but also this system of exchange with other people, with other artists, stayed in my life. Am I not answering your question? No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> um, and maybe we switch to the, the performers or dancers because they are so important and they have such a hard work to do and I was asking myself what, what are the criteria by which you choose them so you work with many of them you work for such a long time and they are so different they have so different personalities and um, it's so touching by seeing these performances as one and after another and everybody is so different even if it's exactly the same choreography and um, To what extent do the dancers inspire you Very much. and your work? Very much. So even that you work out your performance in your studio, then after that, how can we... I do have them in my mind, though. That's why okay. I said casting happens very early on, because okay. they are in my mind. I wor I've worked in the past also with people that were not dancers. And having them in my mind that they're, they have limitations and things that they cannot do, That was very important to have it from the early, from early on in my mind. For this particular work, because I knew I was interested in abstracting the, the body, 
the physicality or whatever you want, however, to phrase it. I knew that I wanted to work with people that are technical and they're, in a way, they're, they have facilities in their body, physical facilities that they can go to extremes with their physicality, yeah? And, but still, there are people that I have worked with before. I'm forgetting the question now. <laughs> the impact um, they have on your work. <laughs> Yeah, but you have, yeah. Yeah, they have a huge impact. Yeah. I mean, they, they are the work. You don't yeah. see what we do in rehearsal. They are the ones representing the work. You, what you see is them. So it's very much about trying to find a, a place that between us we can communicate and make sure we understand what the work is doing and then it's their, it's their own themselves. They're, they're performing the work. They own the work. Today, so many people ask me, why is the carpet pink? Why did you choose this color? <laughs> and I couldn't. I, I have something in mind, but maybe you can... Um, I knew I wanted the carpet, something that it felt very comfortable for people to <coughs> lounge, to lie on, all of that. And also for the performer to feel very comfortable on it. Even though when you first start rehearsing on the carpet, you get full of... Um, scratches and stuff, but then you get used to it. Um, but to come up with a color that actually went through different places. A color is also very specific and it has a lot of representations attached to it. Blue, it would remind of the sea or the sky. Uh, brown would remind, um, you know, the the ground, let's say, grey, everything had something to it. So I, at some point I, st I kept on leaning between trying to find a color that is vivid, but has a bit less nature, let's say, things attached to it. Um, I was thinking of orange, but then there was orange and mandarins and all of these things. I don't know, it was very... And then I thought of purple, but Prince had just died. So I stayed away from purple. And, um, and once I started thinking of pink, in the beginning, it scared me a little bit because it was this childish, womb, uh, girly thing. But then finding the right shade of pink, it kind of like removed it away from that, in a way. And yeah, I went for it. Maybe it has I think it has a lot of emotional things to it as yeah. a color, which it's okay at the same time because it's abstract at once, you know? Even though I, this year, in particular in the U.S., pink became such a symbol of feminism, okay. you know, with the riots that happened and blah, blah, blah. It was a little bit earlier that I did it, so. <laughs> so, avant-garde. <laughs> um, maybe it has, has always also to do with the, with the in, in a kind with the theatrical, theatrical, theatrical element, and it's so... Um, it's such another thing of your minimalism, and so in a, in a way, this pink is totally the opposite of minimalism in a way for me. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it has also to do with that. Um, your interest in the in-betweenness has to do with stillness, with duration. Maybe you can tell us a little bit how you came how your interest in stillness came up. So, um. Sure, um, it was a while ago. I was very interested to create images. I like images, like we all do. But I was interested, I, I was curious to see if I can create images and support them by physicality. By only physicality, without depending on theatrics. Let's say change of lights, change of costumes, sound, to support an image and how to make that happen in the, in the beginning, being in the studio and working, everything looked very much like tableau vivant. I would do something, copy an image that I would see, do exactly the same thing, but that image was much more stronger than what a performer was doing, let's say, yeah? Because an image always had a, a background around it and costumes, clothing, and a lighting that right away put you in a mood. And a, a person alone, let's say in a bare stage or in a bare studio, it didn't have enough information in a way. So I kept on working and trying to see how can this happen, yeah? And 
one of the things that came was, of course, holding the poses for a long duration of time and see how can this be something, and then transferring my weight or the weight of the performer from one perf one pose to the next pose. And for that not to interrupt, the image became this slowness, basically. And then it became slower and slower because I would realize that if there was an accent in there, accent gave it more meaning and a meaning of kind of like a narration to it. And to take away the narration, I kept on making it more flat. And the only thing that was the accent was the timing of how long you hold something. And that's how it came. The other thing that was interesting is that realizing when you put a body in space, it's not, we're not really talking about images anymore, we're talking about sculpture because it's three-dimensional. And that was also something that came through just working, basically. And do you read text uh, also? Literature is, is something text yeah, of or course. yeah, of course. for example. I mean, now I don't read anything anymore just because no, I'm always working. But um. no, your preoccupation, for example, with John Cage or the, the the aspect of stillness. So I think of philosophical texts, for example, or I did what? that. I, I have in the, you know, throughout the years, but that, there's nothing that I can say, oh, this has influenced me so okay. much. And what about Don Cage and his aspect of the stillness? Because you're referring to this paradox of stillness, and you, so your preoccupation with John Cage was more than oh, only an idea. So. It's, so, it's actually so. something that came from after I was developing this language, let's say, and talking about stillness and what stillness is to me in performance, then realizing this is nothing new. John Cage already has said all of this in silence. You know, that's how that came through. Because he was talking exactly about the same thing, but from him being a, a sound person, let's say, he was talking about silence. And me, stillness, I'm a moving, you know, I'm a movement person. But we have this stillness here as well with the soundscape, so mm -hmm. it's, it's the same. And you once um, spoke about that everything um, is like a body, so the, the soundscape, the lightning in a way, the performers, even the carpet can be a body of work that interacts. I think I think that becomes more obvious in the theater, in a theater yeah. space, that everything is much more constructed, let's say, in a smaller space. And that's where I really treat the lights as another body in space. Uh, in, in spaces like this, in exhibition spaces, what, what's that, what I think is the most interesting, it's all of you watching the show. Because you, you all become part of the show, which in theater it cannot be. Yeah, like if I'm watching the show and you're standing right there, you are part of my show. You know, not me, but of my of me looking at that, and it keeps on going like this. Yeah, so everything becomes part of the frame in a space like this. In theater, it's very much about construction in a different way. And maybe you can t tell us a little bit more about uh, the differences when you uh, perform in the theater or in the public space or in the institution like here or on the staircases or in the entrance hall. So maybe you can tell us a little bit because we can see some of these works behind us. So for example, the Hammer Museum or here the, the, at the moment, yeah, I think the Hammer Museum and Documenta, we see this... Uh, interstitial spaces or liminal spaces which are at the same point liminal states so it's uh, always this transitory it's it's a particular work called plastic yeah. uh, and that's intermission and that's staging um, intermission happen on um, uh, bleaches bleaches the where the people sit to watch uh, sports so it's, they look like stairs but they're not they're really white and that's why, in a way, when I went to visit the space and I saw these bleachers, I decided that I want to do the show there and then came up with the title Intermission because the show usually has an intermission because it was a, a sports gymnasium. And that's how this whole thing started, basically, of stairs. It, that was my first, but it wasn't even stairs. It was much wider. And we lied down a lot and watched the people passing by because we were in intermission. 
Uh, then from there on, <laughs> nice. Um, the installing the works in liminal spaces. I like this idea that it's not a stage. I work on, on stage a lot. I, I make performances for theater. And taking the, the works away from the theater, I like the space that is transitioning in a way it doesn't have a house, but then everything becomes a house because the body's there. And with the stillness, we really inhabit it even more. And how accidental the figure can look there and how it can catch the viewer out of guard by seeing a person, let's say, on the staircase or by the entrance or outside an entrance of a museum or things like that. And this moment of meeting and then how that develops. And you already said that you keep on dealing with the aspect of the viewership. And I ask myself, what do you get back from the audience? You as a dancer or a choreographer, if you are so, yeah, if you, yeah, what do you get back? It's so much energy. Okay. It's abstract, but it is. <laughs> it's so much energy you get. And because we've done now, we've performed so much in spaces that, in museums, that there's nobody coming by for hours and you're all alone there, um, like a painting on a wall, anyway. Um, then you feel somebody looking at you, and the, even though you've exhausted yourself, you've already performed five hours, even just the gaze of the person there, it's an energy thing. All of a sudden, psh, you have energy again and you continue. It's strange. I can understand. Um, we are performers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in one of your interviews you said that your work is full of references and representations to different things, I would say. Um, could you give us some examples? What do you mean by that? So are you, for example, are you inspired by, or yeah, by dance or performers? So beside from Merce Cunningham or John Cage, we already mentioned. What about uh, Steve Paxson, Trisha Brown, or even Reiner? So are these important uh, figures for you, or of, were these important? Of course they are important figures. I don't, I don't go in the studio thinking of them, but they were important in my studies and being who I am today, of course. Uh, at some moment, I think every artist moves away from even the people that admire a lot, because you have to find your own voice, even whoever the, your biggest influences are there. And I think people can tell what kind of school you come from in a way, but you have to move on on your own, yeah? So today, the, your inspiration is the world, there's images from everywhere. And working with, working with the body in particular, it's just the body is so rich so, and poor at the same time. It's, there's so, everything, all of our information is here, you know, apart from organs, even as images, all the, everything, you know. So maybe we can open up the discussion. Are there any questions? <laughs> maybe you can go and see the show? <laughs> Stop, stop, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, as far as your choice of carpet, um, to me it just now looks like a big beautiful drawing with where the vacuum has been and where the bodies have been. Is that also um, important in your choice of carpet or something? It's one, it's one style of carpet that we use everywhere. And in the beginning when when we found this carpet, it's me and Kate that did all the, the research to find it. It was, it took a while to find the right carpet and all of that, and the color and the um, uh, texture. Then you realize like once you find it, you stick with that. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, once you find something you works, it's, you stay there. So I've, this is the first time I've seen your work. Um, is, is the carpet cleared every day? Is it? Yes. Okay, so all of the mark makings are yes. oh, interesting. 
Thank you. Thank you. Also wenn jetzt nicht noch eine Frage wäre, würden wir Sie jetzt einfach noch mal einladen, die Arbeit sich anzuschauen und zu erleben. Ja, danke schön. Und wie gesagt, Thank sechs you. Wochen lang. Ja.